Had the joy today to go to Hammond Baptist for a chapel service and um, got to hear that song there and it blessed my heart then and it blessed my heart again now. Well, tonight I've asked you to come specifically and want to talk to you a little bit about Christian education. I believe in it with all of my heart and I'm very grateful to be able to share a few moments. I want to thank you for your attendance. I know it's a rainy night out. Maybe some are watching by way of the live stream. We welcome you. I'd like to encourage you, if you could be in church, you ought to be in church. <laughs> the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So when you should assemble, I would encourage you, if you have a choice between live stream or attending church, you ought to be in church and make obey the Lord in that area. Some folks do not have that choice and, and uh, would watch it because of different time zones or, and uh, different locations or illness. I'm glad for everybody to listen this evening for a few minutes. If you have your Bibles, please turn first of all, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. While you're turning there, I just want to share with you a little bit what a joy it is to be a parent and to have children. Not everybody has that wonderful privilege, but God has given us that nine times in our family with Linda and I, and we're very grateful for that. That's a great responsibility. There are many many commands whenever you're a parent. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he was old, and he's old, he'll not depart from it. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, the Bible tells us this. He says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He said, bring them up. As you raise them, bring them in a place in which you can nurture and admonish them in spiritual ways. That's why I think Christian education is pretty important. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms 127, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Our children do not belong to us. They are, we are stewards of their lives. They belong to God. He's the one who gave them to us. He's the one who can take them away. Linda and I found that out firsthand and had to remind ourselves that though Tyler came to our life for 17 years, it was not God's plan to keep him with us for another year, another day. He would not turn 18 in our home. He would go into the presence of the Lord, and we had to be okay with that. If we're not okay with it, it's our problem, not God's. He had given him to us. And they're his heritage. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. That means he has, a, he, he finds glory in the children that he gives us. And he says, I want you to help make that happen. We find even the Lord Jesus, God put him in Mary and Joseph's home. And I understand as I, if I view Mary and Joseph, many people are unbelievable. Just listen to Mary's prayer as you find out in Luke chapter 1 that she was chosen to carry the Christ child. You can see in that prayer why Jesus chose to give a mother like that to him. And when you see that the, the pensive way in which uh, Joseph handled the fact that he thought Mary had cheated on him, he, could, he couldn't understand it, and yet he didn't rush to to quick uh, opinions. He didn't make rash decisions and he thought and he pondered on this thing and waited for the Lord to give him direction. And then he adjusted his entire life around Jesus. Everything that was good for Jesus became his responsibility to make happen, to stay in Bethlehem for a while, to go to Egypt, to live in Nazareth, and everything had to revolve around Jesus. And you see, wow, what a great dad and mom from a physical standpoint that God gave Jesus to be raised with. But the Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, read it with me if you would please. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. One more time, please. And Jesus increased stature and in favor with God and man. One more time, can we, I want to make sure everybody gets this one. And Jesus increased in wisdom, 
So he outlined that Jesus, the Son of God, who lived in this world, as he was raised in the home of Mary and Joseph, this is told to us between the time that he was 12 years old till he was 30, that he increased in four areas, wisdom. And I think obviously that can be a spiritual connotation, but intellectually, mentally, he increased intellectually. He increased in stature, physically he developed as a young man. And he increased in favor with God, he worked, he grew spiritually, and with man socially. Every mom and dad is very concerned, if you have any sense in your head, you want to raise, and I want to raise, balanced children who intellectually, they're challenged. They're worked, they're, 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 they're sharpened intellectually, academically. I want them to be challenged and worked and challenged in the, in the area of physical activity. I want, I want my boys and to learn athletics. I want them to, to grow in stature and I want them to grow naturally and normally. I want them to be challenged physically. I also want them to grow spiritually in favor with God. That, could, that is the most important area. But I want them to be challenged spiritually. I want them to be in an environment where the Word of God is continually in their face, that is continually reminded of the spiritual things. I want people to expose them in those areas. And then I want them to learn social skills. I want them to be able to interact, to shake somebody's hands. And I know, moms and dads, that is primarily our responsibility. And I'll share that in a few moments. But that was something that was said about the Lord Jesus. That he developed intellectually. He developed physically developed. He developed in his favor with God and spiritually. And he, and he developed socially with man. He learned to interact with those around him. And on that basis, that is one of the reasons why I believe so much in Christian education. Because I was a recipient of it. I remember going to a public school in Picayune, Mississippi, another school in Fort Stockton, Texas. I remember my dad seeing things in my behavior he did not like. I was his oldest son. It wasn't terrible, but it was like, I went to a birthday party and my dad wanted me he bought, a, he bought a, a, a car for the kid that I was going to the birthday party with, but he also bought a Bible. And I didn't want to give the Bible. I wanted to give the car. I was okay with that. But I almost threw a fit with my dad as a second grader to giving a Bible. And it bothered him. It bothered him that I had that attitude. It bothered him that he was, I was ashamed of the Scriptures. Because I had heard, even as a young man, that... That, that my teacher did not go to church. She didn't think it was important. And she was a good teacher. She wasn't a bad teacher. She taught me how to write, and how to read. Most of the kids in my class didn't go to, go to church. They made fun of it sometimes. And I told them I would go. And say, oh, yeah, I don't do that. I get to watch cartoons every Sunday morning. My dad was bothered by that. And the next year, he found out there was a Christian school opening up. And... He put me in that Christian school with my brother Matt, my brother Mark. And for the next nine years of my life, ten years of my life, he kept putting me in a Christian school and all of my five siblings. Now, we always lived in less than favorable inhabitants, government housing projects, small farmhouses, rented, never owned a house. My parents never had a new car, much less really a nice car. But they paid dearly for me to go to a Christian school and all of my siblings. My dad was sold on Christian education. When I finished that, I went on to a Bible college. My brothers did. Of, of the six kids, the five of us have master's degrees. Not necessarily from the same Bible college. We're from a different, different Bible college. We got master's degrees. We all, by God's grace, I think with the exception of one, 
Um, we own a home, taking care of things. Some have been teaching school. Some have been in full-time Christian service. Most of us have been. We've learned to, learned to be used of the Lord a little bit, occasionally. Winning people to Christ is without, I, don't, I think my mother could probably say almost every week, one of our kids tells someone else about Christ. Someone shares the gospel with them. My dad's with the Lord now. But I'm indebted to the fact that my parents put me into Christian, they were sold on Christian education. Then, of course, I, we had our first child, Tyler. We loved him, and, and uh, it was time for him to go to school. Now, Linda has an elementary ed degree, but uh, she thanks God for Christian schools. She find it, it would be very difficult for us to home educate her. I think it's perfectly fine. I'll speak about that in a moment. But then it came time for us to put, put our son in Christian school. And now that was, he would be 22 today if he was alive, and so that would have been 18 years ago. And for 18 years, every month, I've been making a tuition payment for our children to go to school. And making it with no, sac no small sacrifice, paying usually a couple thousand dollars at least a year on just books alone, not to mention uniforms and things of that nature, paying for, for the things that a Christian school would afford to do. So I believe in it with all my heart, and I, and I really hope that one day my kids will appreciate enough that they'll want to do the same thing for the grandchildren that God gives us. But I do that not because I think it's a good idea. I believe with all my heart it's my responsibility. I believe I have a mandate from God's Word. In Jeremiah, the Bible tells us, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, learn not the way of the heathen. He said, do not learn. Be, be wise to those things which are simple, those things which are wise, and, and are simple, those things which are evil, and wise those things which are good. He said, blessed is the man, or happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Happy is the man that decides, you know what, I'm not going to, the problem is our kids don't have that choice. That's a decision made by the parents. Who is going to influence them? Years ago, Brother Roy Thompson was a pastor of the Cleveland Baptist Church. And he was, he was not sold on Christian education. Matter of fact, he thought it was ridiculous. He said, you know, there's no sense in that. Our kids should be missionaries. They should be missionaries to the lost. And I have good friends who still believe the same thing. And once again, I had the opportunity to pastor one church. I'm only one pastor. There are other good men of God who may differ with this situation. You may be here today and you may say, Pastor, I heard what you said. I don't agree with you and that's fine. I love you, and I'll be glad to be your pastor, and we may have lots of different opinions, but I want to I try to put everything I, I believe based upon what does the Bible say and, and make sure I'm comfortable that that, that that is exactly what God says. These are principles. You're not going to find the Bible, thou shalt not, and, and go to certain, certain school. But you look at principles, and you decide what is what you feel like God wants you to do for your children. Roy Thompson, he, he felt like it was ridiculous to have a Christian school. He said the kids need to learn how to be a witness and put them in the public schools. Let them, let them tell people about Christ. Let them be missionaries in there. And he said to this later on, he said, I, um, I sent my, I've changed my position on that, he said. He said, after now a couple decades of sending our canaries and to teach some sparrows how to sing. All our canaries can do now is just chirp. He said, it's one thing to be an adult missionary. It's another one to send children in there. He said, I, I feel like I need to start a Christian school. And he did and has a great Christian school that's still there at Cleveland Baptist Church under the direction of Brother Folger to this day. It's not easy to have a Christian school. It's not easy to home educate your child. But these are things that need to be considered. And they'll not be considered with um, small sacrifice. I want you to notice, first of all, the parents' responsibility. It is not the school's responsibility to raise a child. 
It is not the pastor or the church's responsibility to raise a child. Occasionally, someone will have struggles, and they'll say, I don't know what happened. I took him to Sunday school. I put him in the Christian school. And I say to you, every child has their own ideas about stuff. And there can be questionable results to parents who really, truly love the Lord and did what they can do. But I will tell you this, our children, our, the response of our children is not to the government, it is not to the church, it is not to the school, it is to mom and dad. And every mom and dad needs to take that responsibly personally. And I've seen good kids raised by good, good parents. I've, I've seen some good kids raised by not so good parents. I've seen some real hellions come from, from parents. I can't believe it happened. But I, I, and I'm not trying to figure all that out, but I will say this, at the end of the day, the Bible says fathers provoke not your children, but you bring them up and nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you would please take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, would you please? I don't think you can get very far from any chapter of the Bible that speaks on this any, any more clear than Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is a book of remembrance. And before they go into promised land, God wants to remind them what their responsibilities are. Here's what he says to them, Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, first of all, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Verse number 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Mom and dad, that's our command. Love the church, but love God more. Love the pastor, but love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love the school, but love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your job, but love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He said the first, the first key to raising children that will glorify God, I believe, is going to rest in the bosom of the mom and dad committed to love Christ. He said, now here, O Israel, God's one God. Number two, make sure you and I love him. One of the greatest things we can do for our children is stay crazy about God and crazy about their mother or their father. I think we can raise better children by osmosis, staying deeply in love with God and, and our spouse than we can trying to just focus all our attention on our child. Secure children are much more uh, secure. Secure Kids are secure when they have a mom and dad. I remember years ago, occasionally my parents would get in arguments. Most parents do from time to time. But I remember laying in bed one night and listening to my mom and dad argue and banter back and forth, and I did not like what I felt. Matter of fact, I, I remember laying one night and said, you know what, if my kids, if I ever have children, I don't want to ever hear this. I don't like this. I felt so torn inside of me. I felt so miserable. I felt so insecure. I remember another emotion I felt one day as I watched my dad and my mom walk down the sidewalk. I was walking behind them. I probably was no, no, no older than second grade. But I walked, my mom and dad watched on the sidewalk, and I think it had been after there had been a little bit of, a, of a, a disagreement. And I was already insecure thinking about what had happened and how they were frustrated with each other. I remember walking on the sidewalk, and I saw my dad reach his hand out and grab my mother's hand. And I, and, I, and I watched my mother take my dad's hand. Then I watched him, he just kind of put his arm around and he kissed her on the head and held hands again. Now I thought girls had cooties at that moment. But there was fuzzy wuzzies going inside of me. There was like, okay, we're okay. Mom and dad's all right. This is good. I felt so secure watching mom and dad hold hands as they walked down that sidewalk. And I was only just a little kid. But mom and dad, let me just tell you, one of the best things you can do for your kids is stay connected with their spouse and stay deeply in love with God. Then he says, here's the command to us. Look at verse number seven. And thou shalt teach them diligently. I'm sorry, verse six. And these words, the word of God, I command this day that thou shalt be in thy heart. They should be in your heart. First of all, mom and dad, I'm telling you what, you're gonna find some, you're gonna find some hiccups if, you, if your Bible teacher at school and your English teacher at school and your grade school teacher knows more Bible than you do, you ought to make sure that that is not going to be the case. The Word of God needs to be first be in your parents' heart. Then, 
He said, now get them inside of you and teach them this. He says this, he said, thou shalt teach them diligently with effort. Like, a, like an engineer evaluates things and pushes, like an engraver, put them deep in the heart of a child. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them as a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be the frontlets between thy eyes, and continue on right in the doorpost of your house when you go in and out. It speaks continually about that. Well, that's our responsibility. Getting the Word of God and God's Word and His ways into the lives of our young people. That's, I think that's the parent's responsibility. Would anybody have an argument with that? I think that's pretty clear in the Scriptures. Well, let me, let me say number two, what's the parent's prerogative? Now, this is not given to the church. Everything we've said is not given to the church. I know years ago someone said it's a village to raise a child. Okay? Now, I thank God for the people in the village. I thank God for the other people that love my kids. I saw one of my children sing tonight in the group. I am grateful for someone that taught him the parts and helped him with that. Okay? I didn't train them to do that. Someone else helped them do that. I'm grateful. He'll run on the basketball floor, and my three of my boys are playing basketball. They'll run on the floor, and I will not coach a single game. I won't. I, I've played ball with them for hours, but and, and they know a few things about ball because of me, but but they're going to be coached and they're going to learn a lot more through people who help me do that. I am clueless about a lot of things. And I appreciate all those who will help me, but the truth of the matter is it's my responsibility. And what are the parents' prerogative? What can you do? Well, you've got about three choices when it comes to, to your child developing them in America with the, the responsibility of raising them and helping them develop physically, intellectually, spiritually, and socially. First of all, you can let the government do that for you. You can send them to the government and let the government schools educate your child. You can choose government education. You can choose private ed education. You got a little bit more money than some, and not necessarily looking for a Christian education, but just an alternative to the public system. You can go to private schools. They're available for you. You and I, we can go to a Christian school, or we can home educate our child. You can use government education, private education, Christian education, or home education. In my opinion, the last two are the only options for me. As I look at the scripture, I've got to find out, I feel like if, if, if I've got this responsibility, and by the way, we only have a season of time to have children, I, I really have a hard time turning it over to the government to do it. Their paradigm is different. They've already chosen emphatically they do not want the Bible in the school. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Doesn't matter how smart you are, you, can't, you can be smart and be dumb if you do not recognize God. So that, that to me, prayer, we don't want prayer. Now, let me say to you, there are very good people who work in the public government education system. Probably people in this room right now, and I thank God for you. And I pray that God will make you a missionary, and God will make you a good influence for the many young people who do not have the privilege to attend uh, uh, in a Christian environment. And I pray that God will, God will help you and grow you and, and strengthen you and use you. Tomorrow, I believe, uh, we'll have, I think Linda told me, seven, but maybe 17. I don't know. Where's Linda at tonight? Linda? Where are you at? How many, how many home meetings? Seven. Seven of our public schools. Forty of our ladies are going to go into seven of the public schools and conduct home meetings tomorrow afternoon to help mothers, uh, helping other mothers excel and be able to teach a lesson. And I thank God for the homes and others who've worked and Miss uh, Jessica and for the Andrew Shelton's unbelievable servants of God. They started this and now there's 40 ladies. They're gonna go to seven different public schools and minister there. I'm glad we have that opportunity. I'm all for ministering to there. But at the same time, I think the prerogative I have, if I have a choice, and I do, is gonna be to put my child in a Christian educational system and or 
I'm going to home educate our children. Now, with that in mind, I want to just talk to you a little bit about Christian education. I have some strong opinions about this. From here on out, I will just tell you that uh, you have to make decisions for your family. I have to make decisions for mine. Everybody has their option. And I'm just going to tell you, based upon what I believe the Bible teaches, these are principles I'm very comfortable with for my own children and for our own family and based upon my years of experience. And I, I really kind of struggle a little bit occasionally. Christian educated young people and, and become adults become extremely critical of Christian education. And I don't understand that. I don't know exactly what it is. And, and I, I, I unfortunately didn't get to go to one school. I, got, I went to many schools. I went to several different schools my entire life, probably no less than seven of them, Christian schools. Did about six months of home education, about, about, uh, about, uh, about uh, frightened my mother to death and overwhelmed her. She said, I don't care what it takes. I'll go get another job. You're going to school. You're not going to stay here. I'm not going to home educate you, Wilkerson. But I went to schools where there was 11 young people. Went to school where there were several hundred young people. I went to ACE curriculum schools, to Becca Book, to Bob Jones curriculum. Different kinds of curriculums were used throughout my entire uh, educational process. But I'll tell you what, I have, I have nothing but, but praise, and if I could say this in a reverent adoration, for the pastors, for the teachers, for the coaches, for the youth pastors, for the people who planned my chapels, to the people who drove my buses, the people who taught me math and English and science, for the people who wrote the textbooks, the people who, who went through all that thing. I had no clue, but as I look back on it, I have nothing but praise, and, and I just thank God for that. When I think about Christian education, here's a couple of things that come to my mind. First of all, what's the purpose of Christian education? What is the purpose of it? Here's where I think where the rubber meets the road. The purpose, in my opinion, is to be an extension of a Christian home. To be an extension of the Christian home. Now, I'm not, I'm not against Christian schools who open up to everybody and you come in and we hope to win many of you to Christ. I have actually taught in Christian schools like that. I was a principal of a Christian school like that at one time where it was an evangelistic school. It's not my favorite model. I like, the, I like the CB model. I like the HB model. I like the ones we have here where it is primarily open to people who, who already know Jesus Christ and they really want to mirror what they have at home in the Christian school and vice versa. I think that's the best way to do it, in my opinion. It's a lot less, it's more effective long term. Uh, it's not as lucrative. It's more difficult financially to work that model. Whenever you're just, you're just advertising to your church family, to the people in your church. But I do believe I like that model. I believe it's a good one. Because I want, based of my, best I can, since it's my response to raise my ch children, I would like to be able to instill them for seven, eight hours a day. I'm going to do that someplace with someone who thinks like I think. And not because they have my same opinions, but they use the same Bible. <laughs> they know the same Jesus. They go to the same church. They hear the same preaching. They're soul winning on Saturday with me. They're running and driving a bus. They're working the same ministry. They're a part of the same body of Christ. I think it's just, a, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's a huge response, a huge blessing to be an extension of a Christian home. That's what we believe Hammond Baptist schools should be. That's what I believe City Baptist schools should be, a place that, that models now, are they perfect? You'll never find a perfect school. You're not going to find that. There is the greatest room at Hammond Baptist, and CB is a room for improvement. There's lots of room for improvement. I've been reading over many of our teachers' evaluations that have been going on, and I have those emailed to me and see what our teachers are doing and what they're doing well, what they're struggling with, what they're trying to challenge to do, and I've been working with our, with our administration. I'm looking forward to knowing more about that had the opportunity to go on campus. And because I was in Christian education and taught school for 11 years, and I've done many, many evaluations in my time. I was a principal of school, taken, gone through that. And I was a teacher, and I was evaluated and, and chewed out and other things that, that happened when I didn't do things right as a young 22, 23, 24-year-old teacher. 
Yet at the same time, I, I'm concerned about that. I want to be, I want to be uh, upgraded. I want things to be better. I want our teachers to be trained. However, I want to say this, that I want it to mostly to be an environment that really mirrors the environment I have for my, my family at home. I love that about a Christian school. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4.12 that a threefold cord is not easily broken. In my opinion, a threefold cord for my children is a godly home, a great church, and a good Christian school. I think if I can marry those three things, if Linda and I can behave ourselves and do what's right, and we can go to a church where the Word of God is uplifted and preached and taught and lived, and the gospel of Christ is propagated and people give and they serve and love. And there's a, lo there's a loving environment in the church and we can worship God together. And then I can let my kids go to school for 35 hours a week in a place with people I know, with I see them on Saturday, I see them soul win, I see them drive a bus, I see their, their, their faithfulness, attendance in our church. I know they're making nominal amount of money compared to what they could make. But I know their lifestyle. I see their lifestyle, and I, can, and I can marry those three things. I think my kids have a very good chance to be used of the Lord and that God would channel their lives, and they could be able to mirror that. Now, every one of their teachers they've ever had are not like that. Every once in a while, you get a teacher that's selfish. Every once in a while, you get a teacher that's, that's lazy, doesn't really want to go the extra mile. But those, in my opinion, in growing up and in being a principal of school and in being the pastor of this church and other churches at a Christian school with, several, with, with a couple hundred students in it there, I have found that's been few and far between. Some of the finest Christians I've ever met in my life have been Christian school teachers that have served God faithfully, given sacrificially, work summer jobs, do other things so that they can be a blessing to our children. But I'd like to get that threefold cord going. And with that in mind, I want to just share with you a few things that come to my mind when I think about Christianity. What, what makes a good school? And I, one of the things I love about a Christian school, and I, 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 will, I will support a parent's prerogative to wherever they want. But I love Christian school because I think it's, it, it's if, if you get to a good Christian school, and I believe our schools are good, I think there's obviously things we're going to work on, we're going to continue working on that. At the same time, I love it because a child, I think, can be challenged intellectually, spiritually, physically through the athletic program, and socially interacting with his young, with the people in his school. Does he have to stand up for wrong? Yes. Or is there a bad crowd at C CB? Yes. Is there a bad crowd at, um, at HB? Yes. Are there young people they should avoid like a bubonic plague? No doubt about it. How about the same thing at college? How about Purdue, Cal, you met? How about Wrigley Field at your workplace? Are there some guys you should avoid? Sure. Things are going to have to learn to, to, to negotiate some of those very same issues in time to come. But when you look at a school, what do, you, what, what do you need to look at? Number one, I want to look at, first of all, the people that influence our children. This, I think, is huge. The teacher is the key. The person speaking is the, is the person who's overseeing. That is the key to the classroom. Every good teacher realizes that they are the key for education. The textbook is not the key. The curriculum is not the key. It is the teacher is the key. Number two, we have to evaluate the program. What's the program like? What is, what is there? And this is one of the things I, I just really am impressed with Hammond Baptist and City Baptist. Because I think we have opportunities that we can enhance. Our children will grow and be stretched. I never thought I'd ever be the pastor here, but one of the things I believe that you've helped my children since I've come here. They've been able to, they've been able to, to, to be expanded in areas I think they've been, that they wouldn't have done, and though we had a wonderful Christian school. When they came here, I, believe, I, think, I think that their test scores honored that and showed that the case. But there's also some extracurricular here because of the size of our church, because of the history of our school. It's well over four decades old. Both, uh, both CB and, and HB have, have, have several decades of experience. Opportunities to challenge our children academically and extracurricular ways. You've got school camps. You've got opportunities in music, opportunities in sports and athletics. I think they can be very helpful to us. But the program, academics, I was looking over some of the test scores of our students. And there's no doubt there's areas that 
it, it, and, and by the way, for as long as I've been looking at test scores, you always see areas, ah, we got to get that up. Wonder what's wrong with there? What, what, is there an element we got to consider there? Why, why are they struggling in that particular thing? We have to look at that. Every teacher ought to have enough sense to look at those and say, what can I do to make that better? Have to improve that. But I tell you one thing, it's pretty impressive to look at the ACT scores of last year. We've got numbers of students and well over the, the maximum grade you can make on ACT score is a 30, uh, 36, I believe. Is that right? 36. There's someone who made a 35 on it. Several in the 30s. Several in the upper 20s. The average is a 23. Uh, and the national, the national average is a 20. Look at the, uh, the other test scores. I think there's some things I can see that there's great education taking place. I want to look at the program, but that's important to me. And I'm not trying to sell you on something. I think these are things that you can go investigate for yourself. But I think you ought to, I think you ought to think about, what am I doing with my Christian education? What's the purpose of that? Then I want you to notice one other thing, too, and you've got to look at the product. Now, sometimes I've been very discouraged by the product. I think the reason is we oftentimes push conformity instead of transforming. And this is something uh, uh, we have to evaluate continually. This is something for parents. Sometimes you wonder why a kid can go to school for 18 years and go to church and then all of a sudden go wild. Sometimes because we just push conform, conform, conform. This way we do, this way we do. And we don't teach them why we do what we do. And by the way, we can blame the school, but that's, that's also the job of the parents. Young people who graduate from a Christian school, ah, hypocrites there. There's hypocrites at Wrigley Field. There's hypocrites every place. And you're going to have that. Your mom and dad, you better talk your child through that situation. Every parent, every parent has to got to deal with that and help them understand that and, and temper those things. At the same time, we got to look at the product. And I think when I think about this, I always get encouraged. I get discouraged sometimes when I see young people who graduate, who take a diploma, whose parents sacrificially paid and sacrificed and and so many things were done for that child beyond what their even understanding is to be. And then they go off and shame the name of Christ and hurt the testimony of the Lord and the church. And other things, it discourages me. But I also have to look and see, the Bible does say broad is the way that leadeth to, to, to destruction. But I also look at the sea and I see so many wonderful servants of God. I sat today on a platform with Brother Jared Long. And I believe I, I have the greatest admiration. Brother Jerry went to our school. I look across the platform and I see Brother, Brother Woosley and um, Brother Hassey and Brother Jimmy Vogel. I see ladies out there that, that uh, went to our school and now teach. And I see many of you who went to, went to Christian schools. I sat with a precious family tonight, Brother Reels, and um, others that that even went to City Baptist years ago. I see the, the, the joy. I think about Osman Gutierrez down in Honduras preaching the gospel this evening. Went to a Christian high school here. And they speak, they speak glowing, glowingly of the, of, the, of the education they received. With that in mind, Monsieur, I, I say this. If you're going to have the right kind of people, you're going to have the right kind of program, you're going to have the right kind of product, let me just say it all equals a sacrificial price. It is not cheap. It's not something easy to do. It's going to come with investment. Now, I want to say this to the church family just so you understand this, and I know everybody, there are some strong opinions about this, and, and that's, that's not a problem with me. I understand that, and I respect people who have different opinions than I do. But I may say to you, your choice of education is not about education. It's about influence. It's not so much about education. It's about influence. Who is going to influence your child and what is that influence going to produce? When you start comparing education with a public school and, and, a, and a private school and a Christian school and a home education, you're not really talking about an education. I believe you're going to get, you can get education in those places. You're talking about who is influencing my child. And I think that is where the rubber meets the road. Now let me talk to you a little bit about accreditation. Accreditation is something that uh, our church had, school had been, has been pursuing. And I felt when I came here, that was something that, that I had a real hard time with personally. And I, and I want to tell you why. And, and I appreciate so much that our men of our church have been very gracious with me 
even those who have disagreed with the, with the foundational thoughts of this. But I want to speak to you a little bit about that. First of all, let me tell you, I, I was a principal of a Christian school. I taught in Christian schools for 11 years, was a principal. I took a school through the accreditation process at the pleasure of the pastor. Um, and I'm not necessarily, I don't have a conviction against, a, a Bible conviction against accreditation. But I do have, have some issues that I struggle with in regards to that. Now, you have a couple, couple issues. One is state accreditation or secular accreditation. Okay? Now, that, that, there are some benefits to that economically for our students. If you have, we have a state accreditation approval, then we can get subsidies for our students. That's where it burdens my heart. Because I wish that every single family would put their children in a Christian school. But here's what I find out about accreditation, and this is my opinion. I want to share with you a, a, a where we're coming from here. Accreditation, oftentimes they say, well, that's just not control, but, but it is. There is, there are dictates, and basically, and if you are a private school, if, a, if you own a school and you want to seek accreditation, I think it's perfectly fine. I have a hard time with a church seeking accreditation. See, our Christian school is a church school. It's not just a private school. It is a ministry of our church. And Jesus is supposed to be the head of the church. Now, some folks will point out, okay, we got other things. We have to do fire department regulations. We do have other regulations that we, are, that we also agree with. And there, there is, but there's a lot of difference between influencing a child physically, intellectually, spiritually, with, with education than any other thing. Let me tell you why. The, devil, the devil's been working this for a long time. Education is a very... Uh, in California, because I came from there, they love to teach. The, the first thing, in kindergarten, they're teaching the kids now, of course, you're familiar with this, that they teach tolerance. And they teach... Ever, in the kindergarten, they want this... This is part of their law to make sure kindergarten kids get indoctrinated. If you have a daddy and a daddy, it's okay. If you have a mommy and a mommy, it's okay. As, as sick as this may sound, in my opinion, Governor Jerry Brown signed the law that begins in January that a child that goes to a public school in California, if they feel like they feel more, if it's a boy and he feels more like a girl, and they have a feminine, they feel more feminine, and they would prefer to go to the ladies' bathroom, the teacher is supposed to allow them to go. Even to the point of showers for the junior high and high school. If a guy feels like he feels a little feminine and needs to go to do it in the girls, that's, that, it's ridiculous. And yet it is law. You can look it up. And as soon as Jerry Brown signs it, about five eastern seaboard states agree that they want to do that too. Today we have the bullying law, and I'm against someone being a bully. But let me tell you who's propagating that. It is the homosexual agenda. It's propagating that very hard. They're funding that very hard, and they're getting the government to fund it for them. These are things that, that we, have to, we have to realize we're going through. Let me say to you, there are things. Okay, for instance, we have a state accreditation. We could have done that, and we, could, we were in that. But, and they have a few questions on the test that need to be understood that they're more coming from an, an evolutionary point, okay? You have, to, you have to understand the kids, tell them about that, teach them about evolution. It's fine, you can teach them. I don't have no problem teaching evolution as a theory and explaining what they believe. But I think we, gotta, we have to look, and we're looking at it from a, from a Christian worldview, from a Bible, so we believe that, that creation is, it is a theory because there's no empirical proof. Nobody was there when the world came to existence. So there's no empirical proof, but we believe what the Bible says, that God created everything. We believe that to be true. So we have a, several questions on our, on our test, on our accreditation test, that, that we have to tell the kids, listen, no big deal here, but this right here is that you have to know when that comes, that's fine. And, but we want to keep accreditation. Then we get... Families that take advantage of the accreditation, they get their kids in school. But then what happens when later on we have questions like of homosexual nature? 
and those kind of things. And they are going to be on the test. They are going to come down the pike. When is it you say, hey, okay, now we've enough is enough. What I think we'll do, it, it, will, it will have a real hard time. First of all, we might have a larger school, and that would be a good thing. But then we have people that are sending their kids to school for instead of the normal, I'm going to say $300 a month, they're getting it for $70 a month, $90 a month. And now we say, hey, you know what, this, they've crossed the line here. I mean, this is, this is talking about mommies and mommies and daddies and daddies and tolerance and all that stuff. Now, let's just, let's, let's, we, we, enough of that. We're not taking any more government money, and now everybody's going to start paying their school bill. What do you think is going to happen to Hammond Baptist? What do you think is going to happen there? No, we'll, we'll be like a frog warming up in hot water. By the time we have, it's, it was so hot we can't take it. We have no more strength. Our, mush, our muscles are mush. And our character is not there. Now people are going to Christian school because it is a, an opportunity. It's a luxury and not a conviction. It does come with the price. And it comes with things that, that right is right and wrong is wrong. Now there are opportunities for Christian accreditation. I'm not totally opposed to that. But I do think that it can be a greasy pole. Whenever you just have to keep meeting someone else's accreditation thing. First of all, it's very expensive. But it also is that it, you have to keep meeting credit, credit to it, whether it means you got to add so many more thousand dollars to your library, and there's nothing wrong with adding, adding money to the library. Or making your teachers get accredited or getting more education, that's fine. But usually they'll say, you can't do it at Howells Anderson, you got to do it at a secular university. To get an accredited degree, you're going to have to go, your teachers have to go get a master's degree, but they can't do it where you want them to do it, they got to do it there. And they'll let you in first to some of those things, and then time... So restraints begin to do, and then all of a sudden you're bound up by an outside authority. And that's fine if you're, a, if you're a private school, but if you're a church school, you don't like that because you're a church school. Now, that means that the government understands that. They understand that they cannot keep Christian schools from operating. They're, they're gonna, Christian schools have freedom in this country. We've had unprecedented freedom, and thank God for it. Home educators have good, good freedom. And you have, you have opportunities that, man, you ought to take advantage. By the way, if you're home educating your child, let me encourage you. Be sure you're, you're giving your child a good education. Be sure you're organized. Be sure there's seven hours. I think it'd be good to have six, seven hours of education taking place in your child's life. Take that seriously. I think that I, I've been amazed and impressed with many home educators, but also I've been very discouraged by others. And I feel like there's just, it, it's, not, it's not structurally done well. I want to encourage you to do that. We have, we've enjoyed great liberties as a church and as Christian schools to exist and, and, and enjoy the opportunity to educate our children. But I'm telling you something, when every, any child goes to a Christian school and they don't go to a public school, it is money. It is less money that the government gets. The NEA, which is probably one of the most liberal uh, organizations in the world very very liberal but they, they they are funded greatly by this by this humanistic society basically you're your own God you make your own if it feels good you do it that's the that's the that's the religion of the day but will I will say that in regards to in regards to the Christian education the, the government can't stop us from doing it but here's what they can do they can put pressure on parents to say okay we can't keep you from going to there, but if you go to a non-accredited school, then we can keep your child from going to our school. We can make it difficult. Now, they haven't kept us from going to their schools. Our kids are graduating from, and by the way, if you have good grades, if you, if you do well in your tests, the secular universities want you in the university. They recruit at home educators' conventions. And they're not accredited in that thing. You go to a home education convention, and you've got every major university there trying to get those kids to go to their university, and many of them are not, most of them are not accredited. Okay, so it's not about that. You get good grades, you work hard, you can go where you need to go to school if you want to go someplace. But if you're, a, if you're, if you're average, and you, and you want to go someplace, oh, no, no, you're not, you didn't come from accredited school. We can't approve you. 
And that is something that every Christian parent who puts their kids in a non-accredited Christian school will face in time. And there's where it's going to have to come down to the rubber meets the road. Why do you have your kid in a Christian school? What do you want out of your Christian school? What's the biblical requirements? What is your, it's your prerogative. What's your responsibility? And are you meeting the criteria? You can go to another school. It might be cheaper. It might be even a Christian school. But does not hold the same beliefs. Does not, does, not, does not propagate the same Bible. Does not have the same caliber of teachers. It's okay. That's, that's the decisions we can make. But I want to encourage you to consider the things we've shared about. It's your decision. I'll make my decision. You'll make yours. I love Christian schools. I love Christian education. I feel like I'm a product of it. I feel like that as long as I can be a pastor, as long as God will let us, we want to keep a Christian school with a godly teachers with a good solid improving program and producing a glowing godly product now a lot of that rests upon our, our ability to do that and our and our willingness to to make the hard decisions here but also rest upon parents like you and i to raise our children nurture and admonition of the lord and a church and some of you you're up in years you've raised your kids you're done but you you have grandkids and some of you, maybe you would say, Pastor, you know, I don't want kids to go. I'd love the kids to go there. And you, you, don't, you don't pay school payments. You're done with that. But you have abilities to help kids go to Christian school. You can help a young family who if they, could, they, they can't get three kids in school, but they could probably get two kids in school, and you can help them over the hump, help them get that other kid in school. I'm sure our, our administrators know who they, those people are. You can encourage them there. But I would say all of us, let's pray. Let's pray and let's invite and let's work. And let's, let's seek the, the, what God wants us to do. I find this in Christian education, and there's been some times where Linda and I wrote that, that check, and, and it's hundreds of dollars presently every month for us to put our kids in the Christian school. And I want to say to you quickly, just so you know this, I don't, I, as a pastor, I have opportunities to, to, to send our kids to, to school with, uh, with, this, with the church paying for that. When I became your pastor, I chose not to do that. And I, I chose to pay. Would Linda have done that? Linda and I have done that voluntarily since we, went, since we started putting Tyler in school. We have paid our own tuition. And I do that primarily because, first of all, I have more kids than most people do. <laughs> Number two is because I want to value, Linda and I want to value the education and that we want to know what it's, the sacrifice involved with that. Number three, I want to sympathize with the hurting people of our church who also struggle to put their child in a Christian school. And when you say, and we have to say to you, well, listen, if you don't pay your bill, then we, we, you can't go to school next, next Monday. And you say, Pastor, you don't know how it feels. I can say, yes, I do know how it feels. I write the same check. It's a sacrificial thing. It's not, it's not easy to do, but we can do it together. And God can help us in praying, working hard, living simply, giving, giving liberally, and, being, and making the sacrifice, I think you can do it. Well, I hope these things can be a help to you. If I stirred up the nest, I'm sorry. I don't want to be a, a problem for you. I do want to help you. I do love you, and I want to... I, want to I, I think we can have great reasons to have confidence in what God has given us as a church family. I love the schools. I'm looking forward to being involved with them for many years to come, personally and through our own family. And even after our kids are grown, I hope I will still have the passion to educate children uh, just like I received as a young man. Let's pray together, can we? Father, thank you for the privilege of letting me talk to our church family about this issue this evening. Thank you for the good people that may have different opinions about it. I pray you'd help families Lord, who are struggling to keep their kids in school. It's a, it's a challenge. I know some, Lord, who are really having a hard time. I pray that you would send a windfall of encouragement. I pray there'll be somebody, maybe even help them in these difficult years of raising their children, paying their school bills. I pray you'd help us to improve our education. I pray, Lord, we'd be glorifying to Christ in our schools, all of them, whether it be from the elementary to junior high to high school to City Baptist to Howells Anderson. Help us to do the very best we possibly can. Thank you for the patience of God's people to listen this evening. I pray that you would please help those to take it in the spirit that was given. I do pray we would birth every opinion we have from the scriptures. Give wisdom to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.